By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome back at the Often Troll Cup edition number four. And we are back with our second episode from this glorious tournament. And we are in round two. And in round two, we've got two fantastic decks for you. We've got Frederick, who's playing a Lance Edge deck. It's white, it's red. It also has got some Atox in there. It's super interesting. And he is taking on Rob, Rob van Dijk. And he's playing with the Eureka deck. So it's full of big monsters. There is... Uh, a Nico Bolas in there, but also four Shivan Dragons. It's like a super deck. Now, before I start showing you the deck photos of both of these decks and do my little deck tech thing, I would first like to point out that, as always, you can also go to the MTG games first. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below. There you will find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG games. Click on there and it'll take you straight to the action. And also you can find more information about this tournament in the description below. Links to their Instagram page, their Facebook page. So if you're interested in this, check out the description below. And of course you can read all about the rules for this specific tournament if you're into that kind of stuff. Now that that's all out of the way and you are fully informed, I'm going to start with the deck tech. I'm going to start with the deck of Frederik. Let's have a look at his brew. And here we see the deck of Frederik. So this is really a Lance Edge land text deck. And uh, it's built around these two enchantments. So maybe let's focus on those two cards first. So Lantex, you're probably familiar with it. It's it's used in almost all the formats, I think. Lantex is one white for an enchantment from Legends that reads, at the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for up to three basic land cards, reveal them and put them into your hand and then shuffle, right? So this is extremely powerful. As soon as your opponent has more lands than you, it's, it's bingo, you know, you're taking out lands and maybe you're thinking they're just lands in your hand. Yes, that's true. But still, you will always have enough lands, right, to cast your spells. Plus, the card that you will draw is probably not going to be a land because you're also uh, thinning your library from lands. So, it, you know, it works both ways. It's really, really good. But it gets even better when you combine it with this enchant world from Legends, Lance Edge. So this is a world enchantment and it reads discard a card. If the discarded card was a land card, Lance Edge deals two damage to target player or planeswalker. Any player may activate this ability. So that's quite interesting, right? So your opponent can also activate the ability, making it a bit of a risky card. But usually when you're playing this kind of deck, you don't play out your Lance Edge unless you know that you can win the game on the spot. That's at least what most players that play these type of decks do. So they wait until they have enough lands in hand, until they've hurt their opponent enough so that they can finish it off with their Lance Edge by discarding enough land cards. And when we look at the rest of the deck, it is super aggressive, right? I mean, look at that. We've got four Savannah Lines. We've got three Atox. We've got three Copper Tablets. We've got four Vices. We've got four Chain Lightnings, four Lightning Bolts. So it's going to be really easy for Frederick with this deck to like really quickly get your opponent on 10 or, or on nine. And when your opponent is there, you only need to discard like four or five lands to win you the actual game, right? So this is a super explosive deck. It can go really, really fast. But the interesting thing is the deck of Frederick's opponent, Rob, is also kind of explosive in a completely different way. You know what? Let's take a look at, at Rob's deck and then we can kind of make an have an idea of, uh, of what type of matchup is, uh, is waiting for us here. And here we see the deck by Rob. And uh, this is really a Eureka deck, right? When you look at the list, you see four Eurekas and a lot of beautiful big creatures that Rob wants to cast. Maybe it's good to first focus on Eureka, what it wants to do, because that's really the center of his deck. So Eureka is a sorcery for two green and two from Legends. And its current Oracle text reads, starting with you, each player may put a permanent card from their hand onto the battlefield. Repeat this process until no one puts a card onto the battlefield. And this is really cool. So until no one wants to do it. So even if your opponent says, you know, I'm done with this, you can just continue. So when you play Eureka, it's a guarantee that you can play out all the cards in your hand. I mean, it's, it's, it's super cool. And it works really well in this deck, of course, because we see a lot of fat, big creatures with the high casting cost. But you don't have to pay that casting cost because you've got Eureka. It's perfect. You've got four Sheevans. You've got four Mahamotis, you've got two Trikes, and you've got two Elder Dragons. Now, the Elder Dragons are a little bit risky to just, um, you know, play out without thinking because they, they both have their own upkeep cost. And if you don't pay the upkeep cost, they're going to die. So here, for example, you see Vevictus Asmadi, uh, which has an upkeep cost of a black, a red, and a green. So you got to be able to pay that 
before you put it out with, uh, with Eureka. Although, we also see an Enchant World in this deck, Concordant Crossroads. And Concordant Crossroads, it's super cool because it basically gives haste to the creature. So if you play Concordant Crossroads out with your Eureka and then you play out all your big creatures, you can turn them sideways straight away and attack with them. So maybe it doesn't even matter that you cannot pay the upkeep cost for the following turn because your opponent's gonna die. Now, Concordant Crossroads is an Enchant World. We saw the Enchant World Lance Edge in the deck of Frederick. So that means that, you know, in, in, the way Enchant Worlds work is that if, if you play them out, it destroys the other one, right? So if you play out an Enchant World, you can use it to destroy another Enchant World, right? Which is quite cool. So uh, Rob can actually use the Concordant Crossroads to destroy the Lance Edge, right? But Frederick can do the same. The problem, of course, for Frederick is that in enchantment, you can only play it during your turn, so you cannot play it out in response. Although, I'm now thinking, if Rob plays it out as part of his Eureka, and Frederick also has the Lance Edge in his hand, he can just wait for Rob to first play the Concordant Crossroads, and then in response, during the Eureka uh, activation, he can say, okay, now it's my turn, and I'm going to choose to play out a Lance Edge, destroying your Concordant Crossroads. So that's actually a line of play that's quite possible. Now, there is another really cool card in this deck and also a good card in this deck, and that is Mirror Universe. Mirror Universe is six to cast, right? You can only use it during your upkeep, but its ability is unique. So during your upkeep, you can sacrifice it, and then you can swap the life total uh, with your opponent. And why is this a good thing? Well, the thing with the Eureka deck is if you cannot find your Eureka or your opponent is playing with a pretty fast deck like Frederick, the chances that you get really low on life. But as soon as you find your mirror universe and you can play it out, you can just swap lives and all of a sudden your opponent is on that really low life total and you're flying high on the life total of your opponent. So that is really cool. I'm curious to see if Rob can, can, pull, can pull that off. I think in general, looking at both of the decks, that, you know, it's 50-50 because I see Frederick, of course, he doesn't have access to that whole power nine package that Rob has in his deck. But Frederick's deck is so efficient, it's so lean, everything hurts in his deck, and it works really fast, which is something that the Eureka player doesn't want to see, because usually the Eureka player needs some time. But then again, the Eureka player has Black Lotus, all the Moxen, all the blue power, so, you know, he can go pretty fast as well, you know, there's a lot of acceleration power in his deck, and if he can find a Eureka early, he's definitely going to win it. So, this is going to be a very, very close match, it also depends, of course, if... Frederick is on the play or if Rob is on the play. Anyway, I'm really looking forward to this. Let's just start. Let's go to round number two of the Often Troll Cup. Game number one. Here we go. We have Frederick sitting on the left. So he's playing with his Lance Edge deck. Look at that. He's taking a mulligan going down to six. And on the right, we have Rob playing with, with his Eureka deck. There's a plateau turn one. Max Pearl dropping a Black Vice. So that's going to hurt Rob a little bit here. Gonna probably put him down to 17. There's more action, also with Chain Lightning. Look at that, what a powerful start from Frederick. So he's already dealt six points of damage in his first turn with that Vice. And look at that, just a drop in the pass. This is bad news for Rob. He really needed some Moxen to kind of empty his hand. There is a Land Tax in the pass. So two more points of damage here for Rob. Should go down exactly, uh, three more points actually. Should go down to 11. And he's doing that right now. There's a Chaos Orb. So six more cards in hand there. Because of course Rob was on the draw, so that's correct. So he's already on 11. And this is kind of what I talked about, that Vice Lantex plan. If you got your, your Vice out, you're forcing your opponent to empty the hand. And that means Lantex activation. You can see that happening right now for Frederick. And I wonder if he even wants to play out a land. Maybe he wants to just discard a couple of lands and, you know keep his tax activation going. Then again, I mean, the chances are pretty big that Rob's gonna just continue playing out lands anyway, so maybe he can just drop the land number two. Let's see what he's gonna do. Are tapping the plateau? There's another chain lightning crazy. I mean, for Rob, you can kind of see it by, by his demeanor here. I mean, even, even though without seeing his face, looking at his whole posture, he's not having a great time here. He's like, okay, I'm just getting Murder with direct damage spells. End of turn, we see a flip here on the vice. I think that's a good decision. Got to stop the bleeding. There he goes. I mean, the good news for Rob is at least he's on eight. 
which I know it's low, but it's still three bolts away from losing. Playing a City of Brass, passing the turn. I believe he's got a Mana Drain there in hand. He can untap that uh, Volcanic Island, by the way, so all his lands are untapped. He does have a Eureka in hand. Ooh, it's not a Mana Drain, it's something else. Anyway, we see Friedrich here using his land tax again, so he didn't play a land last turn, so he's kind of guaranteed of a land tax activation. Taking out all the basics, so he's already drawn six cards off of that one land tax, that's insane. And of course, when you take all that land out of your deck, the chances that you actually hit a direct damage spell are uh, getting higher as well. So this is just a really, really good game one here for Frederick. There we see a land for turn three. Are we going to see a land's edge? And is this the game? Four lands, discard. One, two, three, four. That's it. That's it, man. I mean, Rob had no chance. I mean, if he wants to beat this... He needs to draw into some power. The good news for Rob is that in game number two, he will be on the play. And of course, he now knows the battle plan of Frederick. And Frederick has very little information about Rob's deck. So let's uh, give these players some time to sideboard and we'll catch back up with them in game uh, number two. Game number two, here we go. And hopefully for Rob, he'll get a chance to actually play out some cards here. We see uh, Frederick here taking a mulligan, by the way. We also saw him taking a mulligan in, uh, in game number one. I think he's looking for really like specific elements in his hand. Maybe he's, he wants to have at least a land text or certain cards that he wants to see to find uh, in his in his opening hand. Maybe if you're watching this, Fede, it might be interesting for us to know. Like, are there specific cards you're really looking for? Or was this just a hand without mana, for example, or only lands? That could be the case as well, of course. Anyway, drawing a fresh seven. We're doing London Mulligan. That means that... Uh, he can draw seven cards, and because it's his first mulligan, if he chooses to keep, he has to put one card on the bottom of his library. And he's keep it, keeping this one, putting that card underneath, and Rob, of course, on the play. Look at that. This is already a lot better. Just the fact that he's got that mox, you know, his, his hand is now down to five. He can potentially counter. Remember, uh, you know, Frederick knows very little about the actual deck of Rob, so he just simply doesn't know what he's playing against. He would see a plateau turn one and a pass. Remember that turn one in game one, right? It was basically Fredrik dealing six points of damage from the get-go. And look at this game. A completely different scenario. There we see a Black Lotus. Oh, are we going to see a Mahamoti Jin turn two? Is this going to happen? That would be so epic. Please cast that Mahamoti. Yes. I love this. And of course Rob is taking a risk. There we go. There's a red elemental blast, but I love the fact that he's taken this risk because sometimes it pays off. But besides that, this is the way you want to play magic. This is the ballsy kind of magic, you know. I love it, Rob. Absolutely love it. Unfortunately, you got punished with that a red elemental blast, obviously coming from the sideboard. Now let's see what Frederick can do here. So he's got his plateau untapped. Didn't have a land drop yet. There we see another plateau. Tapping both. <laughs> Double bolt here on the life total of Rob. So he's going to drop to 14. I mean, Frederick has just one strategy, which is I want to hurt you every single turn. He's not interested in building anything up. There's a soul ring. He's missing a second green for that Eureka. I believe it's Eureka in the middle. And is that a Triskelion there on the right? And a Tranquility on the left side. Those are the three cards of Rob. Are we going to see even more direct damage here from Frederick? There is a Black Vice that's not going to do much yet. There's a Tax. Now remember, you know, the Vice right now seems harmless. But as soon as Frederick, for example, finds his Wheel of Fortune, the tables turn. Here we see, I believe, a Nico Bolas. It's hard to see, but I think it's a 7-7 Elder Dragon. And now Rob has the option to play the Tranquility, killing the tax, but there's not really a need to do that, though, because the land tax is not activated yet. Then again, if Rob uh, finds a land next turn, he wants to use the six mana probably to cast a trike, so maybe he's thinking, if I play the Tranquility now, 
take care of the land tax, the next turn when I get a land, I can just play it out and I can directly play out my big threat without being worried about the tax. But of course, with Tranquility, you hope to get a little bit more value. Then again, it's probably in there to kill the tax. So there's something to say to kind of play the tax right now. And Rob is really in the tank here. It looks like he's passing the turn. Or changing his mind again. I mean, I, I know what it's like to play against these, you know, these burn and vice decks. It, it, it just puts a lot of pressure on you because you know that you don't have a lot of turns to stabilize. So you got to try to get that control early. So when you do nothing for a whole turn, uh, that's pretty bad. You know, it's always bad, but especially against uh, a deck like Frederick's. Anyway, strip mine here, finding the battlefield, hitting the board, I should say. He could use the strip mine to strip his own plateau and activate his decks. He could do that. Another line of play would be to just go for land destruction here, take care of both dual lands, stripping one and flipping another. There's land number six. There we go and see the trike probably. Yep, there's a Triskelion. And this is a pretty bad target, right, for the uh, for the Chaos Sword player. So coming into play with three plus one plus one counters, he's gonna activate. And a three damage here on Fredrik, so he's going to drop to 17 and a flip here on the uh, trike. So this is this is not ideal. Oh, he's actually missing the flip here. Flip took a little bit too much air. The positive news for Fredrik, though, is that the counters are already off, so the creature is not that uh, dangerous anymore. But this is a letdown here for Fredrik. I mean, two cards in hand, Vice is not doing anything. Now he's just playing out another land. He's kind of given up on the on the tax, it seems, passing the turn. I really wonder if that's a Eureka in hand there for Rob. If it is, he could play it now and play that uh, huge dragon, the Nico Bolas, or does he already have enough mana to do so? There's a Tranquility taking care of the tax. Tapping two, there's a regrowth. Oh, it was a regrowth in hand. Not a Eureka taking back the Mahamoti. And passing the turn because of the Mishra's factory on the side of Fredrik. But things are actually looking quite good for Rob here. Next turn he can cast the Mahamoti. And Mahamoti is six toughness. That's tough to take care of. Unless, of course, Fredrik has, you know... Swords to Plowshares or, or another Red Elemental Blast. I really wonder what those two cards in hand are. Anyway, he's attacking for two first. Going to put Rob on 12, I believe. I mean, Rob could consider to, to block it just to chump. He is thinking about it. Looks like he is taking the damage, though. Yeah, going to go to 12. And a pass turn here. Ooh, an Ancestral Recall. That is quite good. It's going to fill his hand up. So he's going to go up to five. He can still play the Mahamoti. He hasn't had a land drop yet. So he could play it at Underground C. Another Mahamoti. I mean, remember, his deck is four Mahamotis, four Sheevan Dragons, two Elder Dragons. I mean, he's got so much mana now. He can just hard cast everything. He doesn't need Eureka anymore. Tapping six, Mahamoti Jin, the five six flying powerhouse, and the attack for one. And the pass here. I think maybe I would have just jump blocked that factory on the trike. Because life can be so precious against these direct damage decks. Frederick still having four chain lightnings and two bolts in his deck. And there's just a pass by Fredrik. This is great for Rob. He can now hit for five. Put him on 11. Play out another Mahamoti. I would just go for it. Of course, I mean, yes, Fredrik plays with balance. If he has it, he has it, whatever. But you can now hit him for 10 next turn, which is 
Just great. You put him on on one. There's the pass again by Friedrich. No balance. This is amazing here. The only bad thing for Rob is that he has to give uh, Friedrich one more turn. That's the only bad thing. But he can put him on one. Mirror, mirror universe in hand there, by the way. It's hard for me to determine what that middle card is. I believe it's a blue card, but it's hard to see. Anyway, he's attacking for 10. Going to put Frederick on 1. A steel artifact. The problem with steel artifact is that it actually doesn't change the target. So even though he steals the vice here to kill Frederick, it, it doesn't target Frederick. When you play the vice, you choose a target. I wonder if the, the players know this. I mean, it is a really cool way to try to kill somebody with his own vice. But like I said, in this case, it doesn't work. There's a disenchant here in response by Friedrich. And I think they're now being told that that actually doesn't work. That when you cast a vice, you choose an opponent. The cool thing is that you can also really uh, use this card nicely with juxtapose, by the way. You can give it away to somebody else, but the target stays the same, so it doesn't matter. Anyway, I think for the match, it doesn't really matter that much. Friedrich has another turn to go. Okay, you look at this. Yeah, so they are giving it back. They're kind of going back in time. He's making a different decision based on the knowledge that he now has playing a mirror universe instead. And I'm sure, by the way, that if... Exactly, now he's recasting that disenchant. So still making the same decisions. It doesn't matter much, but it's again, it's, it's good to kind of remind yourself of these rules because it doesn't happen often. And you would think, hey, if I get the vice on my side and now target you but actually it doesn't anyway game number two here for rob and his mahamoti jins i'm really happy because this means we're going to game number three game number three the big decider is about to start i do think Frederick is a little bit of a favorite here because he's on the play and he's got vices let's see what he can do here mishra's factory there's the vice there you go that means three points of damage it's like a free lightning bolt there's a Concordant Crossroads there in hand. Ooh, and he's got the Mox. This is so good. He can empty his hand. This is so important for Rob here. Now he only has five cards in hand. Changing his mind there, of course, because the Trop gives him access to the Blue Elemental Blast. That means he can counter a Bolt, for example. This is really important. There's the Savannah Alliance. I was kind of expecting a Bolt there. The Savannah Alliance can attack because of the Concordant Crossroads. That's a really nice uh, use from Frederick to take advantage of that Concordant Crossroads here. So he's on 15. I believe he should have taken a point of damage there with five cards in hand. Should have gone to 14. So missing the vice damage here. And he's tapping the city, taking the damage for the city of Brass. Kind of dropped to 14, so he should be on 13. Playing a Demonic Tutor. I wonder what card he's going to look up here. That is kind of difficult, actually, because under normal circumstances, you would say, you know, go for an SS Recall, for example. You got a blue open, end of turn, you can draw three extra. But in this case, it's it's tough. You've got the Vice against you. You've got the Lion against you. You've got a potential factory attack against you. It's really difficult. You could even consider getting um, a crumble, for example. Black Lotus could be an option, of course, because the Lotus will enable him to play out something big. Again, you're taking a risk, though, if your opponent has some good removal. We saw that happen in game number two with that Mahamoti. He is going for the Lotus. Makes sense. 
it's still his turn. Remember that he's still in his main phase. If he has a Eureka, that would be explosive. Does he have one? Ooh, it's, ooh, it's horrible here, a mind twist. I was hoping for a Eureka, but uh, it is a dirty mind twist. But it's really good for Rob, though. I understand this line of play, and of course you didn't go for the Black Lotus. Look at that, taking care of some damage. He's still in trouble, though, because he's on 14. Next turn, Fede can hit him for 4, putting him on 10. There is another land attacking here just for 2, so he's not activating the factory. Playing a Wheel of Fortune. Wow, this is really good. This is really good. And showing that he cannot play out his Blue Elemental Blast. Because he tapped out to play that uh, Black Lotus Mind Twist. Now Friedrich already played out the land and tapped all his mana. So he's probably just going to pass unless... Hey, he's found a Mox there. Okay, maybe he can do something with that. Play a Chain Lightning or a Bolt. If he has a Bolt, he probably just wants to keep it in hand to see what's going to happen. And look at that, a Eureka in hand by Rob. That is big. Gonna drop to nine, there's the Bolt. Gonna pass the turn, he's gonna drop to six. Wow, what an exciting game this is. He does have a land in hand, he could play out the Eureka. Maybe he should. And now he doesn't even have to use the City of Brass to do so. Oh, we're gonna see a Eureka. Bring it on, Rob, you can do it. Yes, the Eureka. I'm super pumped for this. So what's going to happen now is both players can display out their entire hand. There we see a Shivan Dragon. Remember, there is a Concordant Crossroads on the field. There's an Atok. What else is he going to play out? There's another Concordant Crossroads taking care of the first one. That's the uh, Enchant World rule. There's a Lantex. Oh, this is so interesting. There's a Chaos Orb. There's another Chaos Orb. Wow. I mean, the problem here is for Rob, it, it, he can swing in with the Sheevan, but that's basically suicide. But if he doesn't, then of course... Freyde can use the Chaos Orb next turn to flip on the Sheevan of Rob. So... I, this is not great. I guess he's got to flip on the Chaos Orb here. Right? This is really tough for, for Rob. It's a really difficult situation for him. He is going to use the city. He is going to flip. He's going to go for the Atog though. Which means he'll go down to 5. Next turn, Frederick, Frederick can then flip on the, uh, on the Sheevan. There are, not, there are no right choices for Rob to make here. So he is going to flip on the Atok. And that is a hit. Atok is gone, but the problems remain. Passing the turn here. I mean, if, if, if I would be Frederick now, I would flip on the Sheevan. Remember, he did miss in game one, so maybe he's going to miss again. There is a tax activation, but no, there's no tax activation. Three lands on both sides. For a moment there, I thought uh, that the rope maybe had four lands, but he's got three. There's a tap of the plateau. Oh, it starts to plowshares. Interesting. So you see that Frederick is not using his Chaos Orb here. Instead, he chooses to play the swords and then attack for four. Interesting choice. What did he pick up from the top of his deck? Looks like it was a land. I believe he's got a regrowth in hand there. Gonna go through his graveyard. I mean, there's some powerful cards in there. Could get back the Mahamoti, but he cannot play it out. That's a problem. Could get back the Chaos Orb and kill one thing. Another option would be Black Lotus and then play out the... Wheel of Fortune? There's a regrowth. Is he getting back to Black Lotus? 
That would be kind of insane. That would be a super risky play. He could do Black Lotus into wheel and then hoping that he's going to find another Eureka. But that's almost suicide because you're giving your burn player access to more burn. What is he going to do here? Is he going to... I think he's going to do it. Oh, I love this play. Rob, man, I love the way you play Magic. It's all or nothing. This is the Rob show. No matter if you win or lose, I like your style. But this is basically suicide. You're on seven against a burn player. Anyway, he's going for it. Wow, that's a horrible, horrible hand. Only lands in a mox and exactly let that smashing his hand on the table saying there is nothing I can do here. There's the untap, and that's it. Yeah, Rob's saying, you got this, man. There's no way back for me. And actually, the hand there wasn't all that good for Frederick either. So he could have just, you know, played it out. Maybe he could have gotten one extra turn out of that. But okay, Rob is saying, you got this one. This is going nowhere today. So the victory for Frederick. But it was a joy to watch both of these players play and to see their decks in action. We saw a game one that was perfect for Frederick and a game two where Rob was able to dominate and show the power of, well, not even Eureka because he could just hard cast all his creatures. And then in game number three, you could see again that struggle when you have that turn one vice against you, you really need a little bit of luck to kind of uh, win with the Eureka deck against uh, so much early aggression. Anyway, this was the episode for today. Please join us again next week with more action from the Often Troll Cup. This was round number two, and next week we'll have round number three for you. So if you're not a subscriber yet, please hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. That way you will always be notified when I post new content and you won't miss a thing of the Often Troll Cup. Uh, before you go, I'd like to ask you to do three things that are completely free and they really help the channel move forward. The first thing is to like this video, then comment on this video, and if you want to, also share it on your socials. All these things are free and they really help me and help Timmy talk, so it is really, really appreciated. And then there's one more thing. I also have my own Patreon page on patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. So if you like the content that I make, you can support me as a creator for just $1 a month. And you can do that by visiting patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And if you become a patron of the show, there are some nice perks. For example, you can join all the online events that I organize. I organize a tournament every other month or so. And uh, your name will be mentioned in the end scroll at the end of every video, including this one. And you will get access to the exclusive Timmy Talks Discord channel that's only accessible for channel members and patrons. So please consider becoming a patron. Check it out, patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And now we are ready to go to our fantastic, wunderbar, amazing end scroll with all the channel members and patrons. Let's go. Ik het dus, ik het dus, zomba kazee.